cubren a Zule, la senador Salvador Talams, el 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 gongiergi del el invite tarn al gel vela, el mera de bel 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 vela, Egi mlarnya lunch meeting ra long shore ra el al suelbo e ya katam long al tangat el no sub edel el mesangal el tara best friend der nga ra gim nga ra high school ra hawaii e mal dim la gu ding el wa se nga ngar be la ngi madalal el meu vacation e essensei ra blue ra hawaii e order el gire la phd ngi mang Adalah ramindi ni rasal lebih la oktober rache fase. Alu ki plan ni raklu wal ubung Friday malam lembre ada antinya sendia boleh algam sengai. Enggak mereka weekend mengmal masau la mindi, mengmal masau la Vivian el terak. Tu engya se Jan remember Robin mengak mal merengah sulle leng mal di mlak teng i leng mral it's been such a long time ya kama magoram lam eng mlak ra okoi marak mam meng ang mal di mlak teng i makasem mengwang ra telam engya singka kita tung okar dia makasem lagi makasem mral welcome mral makatetal dia tak suas meng ak mal merengah sulle del name to all mengi ya Robin ya Robin atel give a nervous mak kasin di ako mabtabertial may gaka mal di mo ngil pasul mga nga Robin ni Rasaul el granddaughter ra George ni Rasaul el ngartiang el guk mem isil merki ra at the guk experience ngil sensei mga hopefully nga itigal mga yas kal besel sensei ra blur bela o matirgal guk nga raday nga kal sorin mo sensei el guk sabril share experience ngi inspire ra ngal gel bela o el wase hindi ra ka ko tulungil ako tapo the major at ako ra sensei gire la future ang alget magkul masa Robin low ay sergi dalwa sa ngang ngalgerger taadalal madamal and then we'll take it from there so again once again my BFF Robin thank you when so last minute and thank you Janice for working overtime and having us this early evening um, so I shared with our listeners, um, and I know some people are going to say, how come she's Palawan and you <laughs> speak Palawan? But tenggang ama mlokro ra blura Hawaii, ya the malade amrigel, tiga di malgo tor amrigel ra ablirir, di omolgo tolgo tor belang understand di bolhensing tor amrigel makase ere apivirata maklamo malgo tor belau ingya ku kensi tor amrigel mukom maldiu subes mang so share with us who's your parents and where you're from. From are you from Iraq or where you're from? <laughs> and share with our listeners and our viewers on where you're from and who your parents are. And I just shared with them that your uh, George Nirarsal, former senator George Nirarsal's uh, granddaughter. So, okay. Um, and Klongalgal Ikrabai Ra Teamding. Orior, Mangiwal, um, and George Nyar Saul, Eradok, Ramalgeo, Mangiwal. And then I apologize that my Palawan is not that good. I love your accent. <laughs> it's not an accent. <laughs> um, but I was born in Karor and I grew up in Thumding and Rama de Alai. And so I went to Imaus and Maristela, and my childhood best friend is Marzarin Sato. Uh, then we moved to Hawaii when I was 10. And eventually in high school, I went to Castle High School, Go Knights, and that's yeah. where Jennifer and I Amen. connected. Yeah. yeah. And so I'm honored to be here and really, really nervous. Now, yeah. don't pay attention to the <laughs> mic and you'll be fine. Yeah. So, Robin, what have you been doing? Um, so you graduated from Castle High School in Kaneohe, Hawaii. Yes. And 
you went to college and you what did you major in? Okay. So I went to the University of Hawaii and I majored in elementary education. So I have a bachelor's degree in elementary education and I've taught since 1994, 1994. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's been about 28 years. And I've been primarily a sixth grade teacher, although I have experience teaching K through six. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but sixth grade has been primarily oh. A arts teacher at the school that I'm at. Um, yeah, and so every five to ten years I go back to school. So I have a master's of education also from UH Manoa. And that's in educational leadership in Asia and the Pacific region. So because I'm Palawan, I um, am interested in learning about how to work with schools that are in the Pacific region. And also because I'm in Hawaii, it's Mm. important to understand the history of island schools and how to best reach our students. And then I'm currently in um, a PhD program called Learning Design and Technology. And that also focuses on learning how to use technology to work Mm. with adults as well. So I've been trying to um, hone my skills in doing teacher professional development. Mm, Wow. So So what's new with the national learning technology that maybe you can share with us? I guess it's um, thinking about how to make professional professional development more accessible um, to teachers, especially because people don't have a lot of time. Mm -hmm. And so my program, for instance, focuses on learning design and technology. And so all, most of my classes are over Zoom Mm -hmm. and my teachers model for us how to teach and conduct, um, you know, readings and discussions and how to build community through the use of technology in different programs. And so through going through this program, I'm also learning, you know, how to do this with my students Mm -hmm. as well so this is very helpful during the pandemic Mm -hmm. Um, it was advantageous because it already had a lot of experience doing things online Mm -hmm. and so the transition for me was much easier than it was for a lot of other Mm -hmm. teachers and then I helped my team and so our team was pretty good about meeting our uh, student needs because there were older sixth grade students and then we also had a bunch of tools and strategies for Mm -hmm. making things easier um, and accessible to kids online um, so, how did you end up uh, majoring in becoming a teacher? What what interests you to become a teacher? I always liked school. <laughs> I'm kind of a nerd. <laughs> and so I always really enjoyed school. And then my dad, um, Robert Broadbent, um, he he asked me to um, think about what I wanted to be when I grew up because I wasn't sure what to major in. And he said, well, pick something that you love because it makes you know, your career much more enjoyable Mm -hmm. if you are looking forward to doing it. And I realized I love learning and I love children. And so, and I've had really good teachers. I've been very fortunate. Mm -hmm. And so I decided that I wanted to be the type of teacher that inspires children to Mm -hmm. learn and love learning and, Mm -hmm. um, which is also why I go to school because I love school. And Mm -hmm. so I continue to get my education Mm -hmm. um, so that I can keep up with the new trends and meet their children's needs better. Um, Robin, I know you're not a doctor, but you're, uh, you've been a teacher for such a long time. Mm-hmm. And um, w- uh, we have a lot of uh, uh, young kids, students who are autistic. Um, I know you're not a doctor, but as a teacher, can you um, identify or uh, have they taught you through bo- you becoming a teacher? to see kids who actually uh, have weakness or illness bef- and you're, you can communicate with the parents so they can take them to a medical doctor to examine further. Mm-hmm. I mean, um, as a teacher, have you seen those in classes like autistic kids and what are really the symptoms that uh, can help the young teachers uh, identify mm-hmm. them? Yeah, well, it's hard. There, there isn't just like a couple of, um, I guess, clues that mm-hmm. children might be on um, the spectrum. Mm-hmm. Um, because it's a spectrum disorder, there are many different ways that it presents in different children. And so I've had students who are very sensitive to noise, um, mm-hmm. students who had trouble articulating, so they have a hard time explaining their ideas mm-hmm. or their feelings. 
Um, and then there are students, they call it um, stimming, where they do things that stimulate them. So they might do like flapping of their hands or sort of repetitive motion. And according to the psychologists that we work with, it, it kind of calms them down. So it does something with the brain. So they might enjoy spinning like themselves or rocking. Um, and that's a way of soothing. And so those behaviors kind of are clues about it. Um, some of them are, are, are have giftedness mm-hmm. that we might yeah. notice in school. Mm-hmm. And so for one of my students, he could memorize things really easily. Mm-hmm. But if he tried to ask questions that demonstrate higher level thinking, mm-hmm. he wouldn't be able to do it. But mm-hmm. he could pretty much write anything that he's read verbatim you know like exactly as he's seen it on paper Mm. and he could write it upside down all the way perfectly Um, and then somebody else had memorized the credits to a movie so when they were stressed out they would take out a sheet of paper and they would literally write what you see at the end of a movie and if you looked and compared it it would be exactly the same like the spacing and everything and he'd write it all Mm. the way down and then if he was still stressed out he'd start backwards and he could write it perfectly and there were sheets and sheets and sheets of it so you see these types of um I guess ways of calming themselves down when they're overstimulated because um, part of the spectrum disorder is that it's sensory overload. And so Mm -hmm. for us, we don't notice like the bright lights or the humming of the air conditioning in the background. Mm -hmm. But for students who are autistic, um, that would be very loud for them and it would be distracting. And so people tend to wonder like, what's wrong with you? What, you know, what's Mm -hmm. going on? Because we don't notice it. Um, so it's considered neurotypical. Mm. So something, the neurons in their brain are very, very sensitive, mm. and, but each child is sensitive to different mm. things. So some might be sensitive to touch or to heat, noise. Um, so it's hard. It's, it's all very, very different, oh, which is so why we have to have specialists mm-hmm. who then... Um, to examine yeah. them. Wow, that yeah. w- that's really good to know because especially for the young teachers who mm-hmm. uh, do not have the experience, at least listening to you, they mm-hmm. can identify and maybe inform the parents. Because yeah. sometimes, you know, as Palans, we tend to tell our kids, Pum alalak, lakadi mong right, so right. for to know that, then yeah. they can uh, immediately uh, notice that that they can inform their parents because they act differently when they're mm-hmm. at home and when they're in school. Right. So that's yeah. really good to know. Right. Because at home, I mean, they like patterns. These students are comfortable with patterns. And so mm-hmm. at home, they might have a set pattern and maybe not as mm-hmm. much stimulus. Um, the home might be calmer, whereas mm-hmm. in a school, you have bells ringing. Mm-hmm. You've got a lot of people, desk scraping, chairs. So there's just a lot of extra things. Yeah. And then it's like sensory overload. Mm-hmm. Um, so it helps to recognize that and allow the child, whatever way that they calm down, mm-hmm. to maybe go for a walk or mm-hmm. um, maybe let them rock. Or mm-hmm. some of my students stand and they wiggle and mm-hmm. it's okay. Um, but learning what helps that particular child mm-hmm. and knowing that what we do for all, all children may not fit. And it's mm-hmm. okay to have different you know, expectations for different children and allow mm-hmm. them to have um, special accommodations mm-hmm. to so that they learn best Um, because if we don't then it's overwhelming for them and it's not their fault Mm. right it's their senses are just very very sensitive Mm. to everything um i noticed there's a lot of uh, indian students in the u.s that has very very high iq Mm -hmm. um share with us with your experience and um you working on your PhD, how can uh, a young teacher identify that this kid has very, very high IQ? Well, I don't know. Or, or share, yeah. yeah. I, I don't know exactly how to measure the mm. IQ. There, they have tests for that, but I have, I have been a gifted and talented teacher. And so for students, I assume if they're high IQ that they would mm. fall under the giftedness category. Yeah. And so for students who are gifted, these would be children that you assign something to the whole class and they would either finish first or they would overcomplicate the assignment. You know, maybe mm. you just want something very small and then to them it's too simple and so they make it more complex than it needs to be but that's Mm. how their brain is working Um, and they're very passionate about learning and Mm. so they tend to go above and beyond in terms of the depth that they show and maybe even the breadth like how much information they share because Mm. they're so interested in a topic Um, versus you know our traditional students when you assign something they're like oh do we have to do that or you know it's they they try to negotiate doing less but for somebody who has a high IQ or who's gifted they tend to 
think that what you're asking them to do is too simple and then they make it a little bit harder or more complicated. Mm -hmm. So you'll see that in the quality of work, theirs tend to be much more complex mm -hmm. and, you know, sophisticated than mm -hmm. the average student. Wow. Yeah. It's really, really good to know, and I know that a lot of young teachers who are listening, mm -hmm. I'm sure they're being inspired with what you're sharing with us. I mean, I'm I'm not a teacher, but just listening to you, it's just exciting. Have you ever thought about returning back to Palau and help with our education? All the time. <laughs> I think about that all the time. <laughs> yeah, so my mother and I are interested in returning every summer, so, yeah. right, Mom? <laughs> so we and then I, I love teaching and obviously I love working with teachers and so I I have had an opportunity to go to South Africa and I've worked with teachers there and it, wow. I loved it learning the culture and the language and just working with these amazing teachers um, during their breaks and then mm -hmm. also um, I worked with Prel I think some of you might know yes. Prel yes. and that was a couple of summers ago and it was online mm -hmm. working with um, teachers there and there I was just so impressed by the teachers in the mm -hmm. Pacific region and so I'm hoping to do have more opportunities to get to know teachers so you especially only that. you travel during the summer and then mm -hmm. oh wow yeah so that was during the summer I spent five weeks in South Africa wow. and it was yeah with teachers across borders mm -hmm. it was an amazing experience but after learning all of that and then um, part of one of the projects that I'm on at school is learning about indigenous people. Mm -hmm. And so whatever I'm learning about indigenous people in Hawaii, I always think about like this would be beneficial for people mm -hmm. in Palau. Mm -hmm. And I was even telling my niece, Jewel, that she needs to appreciate her mother, Mindy, because um, it's amazing. My mom and I were sitting there with Mindy and she can tell us all of these, you know, traditional cultural practices and you know talk to us about special plants and she taught me how to cook palau and onraula right um kugao right and so i was able to do that and build a traditional fire and um it's it's exciting and she's mm -hmm. teaching us about the different foods and so i told jewel who's you know only a child she's seven that this is really important and you're so blessed to have a mom who knows the traditional practices because if we don't continue to perpetuate it it will be lost like the Hawaiians yes <laughs> and so that's what we're trying to do in Hawaii yeah. is we're trying to have our children not only learn about Hawaii and understand like where our school is located and the special stories mm -hmm. connected to the land because we want to perpetuate Hawaiian culture since we're in Hawaii but then also to have the children then go home and if they're Chinese or Vietnamese or Japanese or you know from a pacific island for them to then be interested in learning about their cultures and their traditions so that we can continue to sustain these and i'm part of um, an international association it's a think tank where we have teachers from all over the pacific and europe and we get together and this year's theme is we're trying to figure out how do we as academics in a university and we tend to focus on traditional western knowledge how do we also then honor the traditional knowledge of the places that we're all in mm -hmm. and um, continue to perpetuate that and, and blend that together mm -hmm. and i think uh has done a really great job of bringing traditional hawaiian um, knowledge to campus and trying mm -hmm. to teach the people who come to uh about what Manoa is mm -hmm. like the place of Manoa and the different traditions and um, appreciating you know the culture and tradition of Hawaii and I would love to see that also in Palau mm -hmm. and I'm here to learn the practices mm -hmm. and everything that my auntie has to teach me <laughs> that's awesome because yeah. uh, I'm sure you were you're over at UH Manoa and you've uh, heard of uh Nainoa Thompson. Yes. I was very oh. honored to sail with him, oh. uh, me and former President Tommy Ramasau Jr. Oh, from Yap okay. to Palau. And uh, as you know, um, the Hawaiians lost their traditional yes. navigation yes. for 600 some years. Yeah. And they were uh, lucky enough to find the navigate, master navigator Mao mm -hmm. in downtown China. And they uh, brought him to UH to teach the traditional right. navigation and so now Nainoa just took it and ran he's just like sailing yes, all over yes. the world and he's been to Palau when we sailed from Yap to Palau yes. it's a great experience so yes I yes. totally agree with yeah. you that we should value and continue teaching our kids the yeah. traditional knowledge and you know yes. our culture yes. because if not we we might end up like Guam. Guam are trying to use their old uh, uh, names for their hamlets and their right, city. Right. Yeah. Not like before, you know, 
it's a it's a ganya and now they change it back to their old traditional name hagatnya so yeah sometimes we don't realize but when it's gone that's when you realize mm -hmm. that man it's too it's too late right right yeah yes. and everybody seems to be becoming more western than yes yeah. and western is not bad yeah <laughs> but we have a unique culture i mean mm. Palau, there's nobody else i mean mm. palau is such a small mm. place and we have such a unique culture that it would be a shame mm. to lose that mm. and once our elders are gone or people like mindy who are raised by mm. elders then we don't have access to that mm. information yeah. and what we then try to revive is not ever going to be authentically mm. yeah. what was palauan mm. and yeah no yeah. i'm so happy for you <gasps> Thank yeah you. <laughs> you're just you just inspire me yeah. makes me want to volunteer teaching sports or something yes you school. should <laughs> i think you should yeah. <laughs> um yeah share with us the social and emotional uh, learning yes yes so that's something that we started um thankfully before covid so for great for my grade level we've been doing it for i think this will be our eighth year and we recognize that um, we tend to focus on academics as teachers, but it's really important to also look at what children need. Mm. And so um, I'm one of the people who writes the curriculum and I have a partner teacher. And so we work together to try to look at our sixth graders and figure out what do they need to be successful. And oftentimes when you think about our teachers and parents, if, if you look at the patterns, we tend to notice that children don't know how to organize their papers. They don't have time mm -hmm. management. They might have trouble regulating their emotions. You know, like if they feel sad or angry or stressed out, they may not have strategies for how to deal with those strong feelings. Um, and then even friends, you know, peer interactions, mm -hmm. like how to deal with peer conflict or working in a group. And so we've come up with um, lessons to teach our students how to address those skills. Wow. Because those are not normally taught in yes. you know math and social studies mm. and science and all of that but those are really important mm. and those help children be successful and so wow. we've made it every morning for the first 30 minutes um, for my grade level we teach the social emotional learning and so we have them you know, we practice mindfulness because mindfulness kind of helps us reset mm -hmm. we tell them it's like an ipad or a phone if you don't reset it it gets glitchy and mm. we as humans get glitchy too and so taking that time to just practice breathing deeply and having them recognize like how do you feel when you're angry like my heart races and like now when I'm nervous to come on this show I got really sweaty <laughs> and I was sitting in air conditions so I'm like okay I recognize that I'm nervous right but then everybody else maybe they have a stomach ache or they yeah, get like jittery right and so yeah. and just having them being aware of like how do I feel when I'm angry or sad or nervous or whatever it is and then, and then and what are strategies for dealing with that mm -hmm. and so I talked to my aunts and my mom and they helped me to not be so sweaty <laughs> um, and then I'm able to be here and hopefully be somewhat articulate but um but so, those are really important that's what we yeah. call social emotional learning is that we're we're teaching them their social skills we're teaching them like to be emotionally aware and to and to recognize that anger isn't bad but it's how you deal with mm. anger right because we don't want them to grow up and be violent or you know be addicted to things or even teaching them how to ask for help mm. right we all need help yes. and so it's it's a skill to ask mm. for help and so it, those are all things that or under social emotional learning so that's what you do uh the first 30 minutes mm -hmm. before you begin class yes wow. and a way to build community right yeah. so in sixth grade we have um half of our students are new and so part we started off thinking okay these kids are new they don't know each other and so we focused a lot on having them get to know each other playing mm -hmm. getting to know you games and forcing them to interact so that way they feel like they've made mm -hmm. friends and they're connected but later on in the year, we realized, oh, half of them have really messy binders and desks and they mm -hmm. can't find anything or they forgot they had homework. Mm -hmm. And so we started working as a team to teach them strategies for how to be organized. And it helps. And teachers, if you're listening, it helps if all teachers are saying the same thing. Because mm -hmm. what, what I realized when I was taking classes is that it's really hard for me to remember which teacher wants things a certain way. Like one teacher wants my name on the left side, one teacher wants it on the right side. Mm -hmm. And you know, one teacher wants 12 inch times New Roman mm -hmm. and another one wants Arial size 10. Mm -hmm that's a terrible thing to do to children right as an adult i think it's a terrible thing to do to yeah. me but but for a child and so to talk to the grade level and agree on certain things like let's make it as easy for children as possible mm. so that they're focusing on the skills and concepts that we're learning versus mm. where do i write my name mm. 
you know what I mean? So it's little things like that. That's awesome. Yeah. Wow. I mean, I don't think our schools are teaching that. It would right. be nice. That's like, just like uh, that general in the military, I think he's in the army. He said, the first task to do when you get up is you have to fix your bed. Right. So at least you did something right <laughs> the first. <laughs> yeah. 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 First thing in the morning. Right. So it's similar to that. Yeah. And I think that's also important. Like um, when I first moved to Hawaii and I had my fifth grade teacher, Mrs. Dawson, is like an amazing human. She passed away, but I want to be Mrs. Dawson. Um, and even though I didn't speak English and I didn't understand the routines, she was very patient with me. And because like she'd teach the whole class and then she'd come and either talk to me or bring me to her desk and she would go through it and she's very patient mm -hmm. and then she would tell me you're not dumb because mm -hmm. other kids would tell me I'm dumb and they don't want to be my partner mm -hmm. but she would tell me you just don't know it yet mm -hmm. so you're still learning mm -hmm. and so I think that's really important for us to recognize that children may struggle in school but that has nothing to do with intelligence mm -hmm. right they could be missing vocabulary um, they could be missing um, you know some maybe some skills or concepts mm -hmm. and we as teachers need to recognize what those are and fill it in so that they can be successful in whatever mm -hmm. we're teaching but children are all extremely bright but if we believe in them they will rise yes. to those challenges mm -hmm. but if they feel that we're annoyed that they don't understand mm -hmm. how to do something or they're taking too long or you know for the children who are coming from other mm -hmm. countries to Palau um, they need to understand that we believe in them and that they're mm -hmm. bright mm -hmm. it's just they're learning everything you're teaching plus how to speak Palawan mm. and maybe even how to speak English mm. and that's it takes time and so hopefully we all can be Mrs. Dawson's and mm. you know help build up our children what makes a great teacher I think you have to truly want children to be successful and believe in them and like them regardless of how annoying they may be that day <laughs> right um, like I tell my kids my I call them my kids my students um, that I'm like their mom, right? Mm -hmm. I may scold you, but the next day, it's a, it's a brand new day and we're gonna start fresh and I'm gonna forget everything that happened the previous day and it's a brand new beginning. Mm -hmm. But I think we need to teach children that because mm -hmm. otherwise when we scold them or perhaps if you're having a bad day and you're mm -hmm. annoyed, yes. I always tell them I'm grumpy because a teacher made me grumpy. It's not you. I need space mm -hmm. to kind of calm down. So I, I think when we articulate all that and we show them that as an adult, I can have you know, bad feelings and I need to have that time and space to feel better and it's not any of you mm -hmm. that are making me feel this way. And then once you're better, then you say, okay, I feel better now. Thank you for being so patient with me. But I think we need to kind of model that for them mm -hmm. so that way they don't think that we don't like them. I think that's a terrible, terrible thing um, for a child to ever think that we don't like them or we don't honor where they are in their learning mm -hmm. journey because some of them might take a long time and eventually they'll get there and some kids learn really fast and the rest might be at the same pace but I think a good teacher recognizes that and they're willing to take that challenge on a, a, in a positive way mm -hmm. and not be in an annoyed way that mm -hmm. you know you're taking up too much of my time and why don't you hurry up and be where mm -hmm. others are at but I think a good teacher sees that every individual is different and they find it rewarding to figure out what works for each child so yeah. that that child is successful and yes. happy. I think that's, yes. and that you truly find joy in being with them because it's a gift to have 10 months with these children. Mm -hmm. you know? um, throughout your experience as a teacher, um, just by listening to you, I don't think you have your favorite student and your worst student mm -hmm. or favoritism as they call it. Yes. Um, have you seen teachers who are uh, who have favoritism in class and how yeah. do you handle that or how, what can you share with the teachers who are listening yeah um, well I think you know um, my mom was a good mom well she is a good mom um, <laughs> like she has three children and she never showed favoritism mm -hmm. right and I think I mean we just have to think about ourselves like what if you have a parent who clearly favors one child over another how does that make you feel and it's the same way with the children in your class right so I I mean the kids will even say and I had somebody write a thank you note saying thank you for um, being kind to all of us and showing that you like all all the students in your class because my students move from class to class and they they can tell that there are people who have favorites and it might not really be true favoritism but sometimes teachers connect 
easier, right? Mm -hmm. You're an athlete, so you might connect easier with athletic athlete. children, right? Where somebody else might, you know, for an art teacher, maybe connect better with an art student. But we just need to be intentional in making sure that every child feels seen and heard and that they don't feel invisible because we're so busy focusing on a child that's just like us. Mm. You know, and I don't tell other teachers what to do because that would be bad <laughs> as a colleague to go around being like a know-it-all and <laughs> be like, "Hey, I noticed you're being, a, you know, showing favorites. Stop doing that." Uh, yeah, that's not good practice as uh, teachers to, you know, do that. Yeah. But hopefully, by modeling, yeah. and you know, I shared what the student had written, hoping that if there are colleagues who are doing that, that they step back and think about mm -hmm. it. You know, and um, have you seen bullying in school? Unfortunately, I think that's always going to be present. Yeah. Um, I think the degree of bullying is different, right? Mm -hmm. So when I first started teaching, it was more like maybe verbal or physical, and it usually always happens outside mm -hmm. of class, right? And then we find out about it when children eventually tell us. Um, but now with the rise of you know, the access to digital mm -hmm. devices, um, more things are happening online mm -hmm. and so that makes it a little bit harder mm -hmm. for us to see unless a student brings it to our attention um, but that's also why for the social emotional learning we talk about setting boundaries mm -hmm. and we teach them about like if you have a cell phone please don't pass other people's numbers to them have them do mm -hmm. it don't take pictures without people's permission don't post things without people's permission and so we try to address those issues but at least one incident will come up each year of somebody feeling bullied because somebody is um, doing something to them. And so we also define bullying, I mean, this is not my definition, but the true definition of bullying is that it has to be intentional, it needs to be re and repetitive. Mm -hmm. And so we tell the children what it is so that if it should happen to them that they seek help. Mm -hmm. um, and usually a child who's bullied, it's because they've been bullied, mm -hmm. either by others or at home. Mm -hmm. And so it's good for us to try to work through all that and help them. And we have counselors who are trained yeah. in helping our students deal with these things. Well, uh, um, it's good that you mentioned about uh, you teach your students or the, uh, uh, that uh, you can't take photos mm -hmm. and video of people without permission mm -hmm. because um, I know you're on social media and so and it's not only in Palau mm -hmm. it's all over the world where uh, nowadays a lot of kids have a cell phone right, right. and they tend to video people who are fighting or mm -hmm. uh, peeing or oh, and so yeah. it would be ni it's nice that you mentioned mm -hmm. that and mm -hmm. hopefully if there's uh, teachers who are listening they can also educate their students that yes it's not good to take videos mm -hmm. and photos of people who are fighting or you know right. without their permission period right and yeah. that we should be part of the solution so yeah. we you know recognize that there's sort of this weird human need to be mm -hmm. part of drama but mm -hmm. what we try to tell students is that you know we want to be good people mm -hmm. and so as a good person if i see people fighting is it a is it a good thing for me to take out my cell phone and mm -hmm. be videotaping mm -hmm. that and like excited to post it or should i be helping the situation mm -hmm. you know helping by yeah. stopping the situation right mm -hmm. getting an adult and calling the police mm -hmm. or whatever it may be and so we're hoping that if we talk about that before they're in that situation mm -hmm. that the things that we've been sort of broken record mm -hmm. we repeat it often throughout mm -hmm. the year yeah. Yeah. Um, sticks with them and that mm -hmm. they do the right thing. Mm -hmm. And then we always, I mean, it's helpful for children to see if they're in that situation. What mm -hmm. is somebody we're trying to beat you up? Mm -hmm. Would you want people mm -hmm. filming it or would you want mm -hmm. them to help stop and protect you? Mm -hmm. And that way, you know, because children are egocentric, mm -hmm. right? Everything is about them. So it helps to have those. I was situations. thinking about the social and emotional uh, that you mentioned, and I think it's. That's actually really important mm -hmm. before yes. you actually dive into the mm -hmm. teaching mm -hmm. because you you shared and then you shared about uh, students asking permission before they tell videos or right. photos of any other person. But on the social and emotional side, I was thinking that also it, it's actually really uh, a very important mm -hmm. because if you're socially and emotionally disturbed, right. then you can't even do your, right. you can you're not comprehend what the teacher's yeah. teaching you and you cannot do your, your work. Mm -hmm. So it's not necessarily just 
I'm sure you, maybe you forgot to mention, but it's just not about organizing their right. papers. It's also about their whole being, yes. mentally, emotionally, yes. physically. Mm -hmm. And so it will give the student a drive to want to learn listening to the teacher teaching right and then i mean in the beginning they're annoyed by it because it's something new and different yeah. so they're like why do we have to do this you know mm -hmm. and or else they feel awkward because you make them breathe deeply mm -hmm. and we have like you know those yoga mindfulness mm -hmm. they're very short videos on youtube so we have them do that but mm -hmm. i model doing that also mm -hmm. you know and having them be aware of it but we also try to teach them that um you know, if something bad happens to them, right? We and I always say life happens. So if you're trying to do homework and your dog gets sick or gets hit by a car or whatever, mm -hmm. you're going to be emotionally traumatized mm -hmm. and you're not going to be able to concentrate mm -hmm. on your homework. So please tell us mm -hmm. that that's happened to you. That way we can, you know, support you mm -hmm. as a human and then worry about you doing the work as a student later when mm -hmm. you feel better. Mm -hmm. But I think it's letting children know that we don't always control the circumstances mm -hmm. around us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, and that sometimes we can't, right? I can't concentrate if I'm feeling worried that my mom's in the hospital or, mm -hmm. you know, maybe I haven't seen my mom because they're traveling to help another sick relative. And so all those things are important for children to be able to share with us mm -hmm. so that we can, you know, modify what mm -hmm. the expectations are and give them the extra support. Well, that's yeah. really, I, 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 I know that um, teachers who are listening to this will realize how important the mm -hmm. social and emotional I, I believe it's really yeah. I, I mean I've never I'm not a teacher although but just listening mm -hmm. to you I think the social emotional and physical mental is very yeah. very important yeah. and that's where the student can actually uh, have the drive to really want to mm -hmm. learn and so um, I'm glad that you shared that I, I hope yeah. that you know the teachers who are listening can actually apply this to their first 30 minutes mm -hmm, not mm -hmm. just you know their work but the whole being of a student to be able to want to learn right. and comprehend what they're teaching mm -hmm. that's really yeah and yeah. it's yeah it's helpful and it's helpful to do it as a team mm -hmm. i could do it by myself but it's not as powerful as if every um, sixth grade mm -hmm. teacher does it, mm -hmm. and no matter where that student is at, mm -hmm. they're getting that support that they need. And then we also talk to each other. So if I find out something, I ask the child, like, can I share it with your other teachers? Because mm -hmm. we want to be sure to support you. And usually they'll say yes. Sometimes they're not ready yet. So I'll mm -hmm. just say, let me know. Because if, if they know what your situation is, then they can also, you know, be more understanding mm -hmm. or patient with you. Um, but I think it's empowering them, yes, right, to be able yes, to definitely. explain their mm -hmm. life and situation and not having us judge them, mm -hmm. but having us be an additional support system, especially when things are going wrong at home, mm -hmm. you know, like people are in crisis, mm -hmm. then it's important that they know somebody's there for mm -hmm. them. Yeah. Um, you mentioned that um, when they have problems at home or crisis at home, mm -hmm. um, throughout your experience as a teacher, um, why why do students there students who are just not smart they they just don't have interest in school mm -hmm. and they're barely making it what as a teacher what can you share with parents who are listening uh, because you know palans we tend to say oh you don't you, oh, you, you, don't yeah. really no but this yeah. is and yeah let's and, not say that yeah, yeah so i not, think yeah. Uh, I would like for you to share so parents mm -hmm. who are listening, we can inspire them to how to be able to help their kids. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean, because to me, I noticed that uh, in school there was a lot of really smart people. Mm -hmm. But now uh, the smart people and those who weren't that smart, who, are, who were, uh, weren't barely making and passing the grade, now they're very successful. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So like you mentioned, we all have different gifts and talents. Right, right. But I would like for you to share with parents who have their kids who are struggling in school, what mm -hmm. advice can you share with them as a teacher? Yeah, well, I think um, there are many different reasons why children, it's motivation, right? Um, where children are not motivated to learn. And so a lot of times we try to figure out what the root of the problem is and usually children can't articulate it but it starts from when they're very little and so one of the first things is not to judge children and tell them that they're gabalung um, but to understand that learning is different and so again if you have 
several children, it's not good to compare children because every child is different, even if they're your children. Um, but to honor every child's learning growth and, and to honor the fact that you're trying, mm. right? I think um, giving them more credit for trying something versus actually succeeding at it mm. is way more important because it's that effort that will see them through. Mm. Um, and it's not to say that you're going to be a cheerleader for every single thing that they do because they know if you're being authentic or not. Mm. But it's to give them that idea that if something is worth doing, then you're willing to invest the time and the energy into doing it. Mm. And that intelligence is not something that you're just born with. I mean, some people have an, a capacity, mm -hmm. right? It's easier for them to learn, but everybody can learn. It just might be more difficult and it might take a little bit more time for somebody else, but we all are capable of learning. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's where it changes because a lot of people seem to tell kids, oh, you're so smart, you're so smart, right? Mm -hmm. But then the minute they do something bad or they get a bad grade, suddenly now, I'm, now they feel like they're dumb. Mm -hmm. And so we need to focus more on the effort. Like when my students get a bad grade and they're shocked, I ask mm. them, well, did you study, mm. right? And so we're looking at the behaviors mm. that help them become successful versus mm. like, oh, you're not smart because you didn't do well. Mm. Um, and I think it's changing how we perceive intelligence and how we perceive student achievement mm. and celebrating them for, achieve, for you know, putting in that time and effort, even if they don't quite make it, and to recognize that learning is hard. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you have to work really, really hard and maybe only get a C or a B, mm -hmm. but you did your best and I'm proud mm -hmm. of you. Versus like, I want a perfect paper and if you don't have a perfect score, then you're not smart. Then we're beating down that child. Mm -hmm. And then eventually, why would they try, right? Mm -hmm. So if at school, they're, they're hearing that they're not smart and then at home, they're hearing they're not smart. Well, I'm not gonna try. Mm -hmm. Right, because my efforts are not gonna, you know, then it's like they have control, mm -hmm. right? If I don't try and I fail, I chose mm -hmm. to fail, right? Versus mm -hmm. I tried and I didn't do it and now everybody around me is disappointed in me. So it takes a, a shift in how we perceive students and how they do things. Mm -hmm. So I don't ever tell kids they're smart. Mm -hmm. I said, you tried really hard, you did your best and it shows. That way they see that the connection is, is their effort and the time that they put into it versus, oh, I know Jennifer's smart. She'll always do well no matter what. Because then if kids struggle, then they're like, well, Jennifer's smart and I'm not smart, right? Um, then they give up because why try? Wow. I'm not athletic. That's a real big difference from saying smart and you did, you know, yes. and so it shows in your work. Yeah. Wow. So if somebody does a good job, I said, oh, I'm glad you studied. You were successful. I never say, oh, you're so smart. Mm. You know, you studied, good job. Let's study a little bit more. I'll help you. Mm. Yeah. Wow, that's a really good point to know. Right. Um, Children will do what they are good at and they will mm. focus on that. Mm. Yeah. So every child is smart, just different kinds of smart. Um, does Hawaii have that achievement uh, test? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, how can we make our students do well in that? I think a lot of it is vocabulary and all, I mean, math vocabulary and math skills and concepts, as well as reading mm -hmm. skills and concepts. I think when those are strong, then they'll be successful in their testing. But it's also, you have to think about those tests are written um, usually by mainland companies. Mm -hmm. And so if it's something that we are then testing Palauan students with, it may not be culturally appropriate, right? If we're talking about sledding in the snow, most of our students in Palau don't know what that is. And so they're already at a cultural disadvantage for not having those experiences. Mm -hmm. And so um, I would take those kind of tests with a grain of salt, just because it's not, you know, if you take a look at the, the test items, they're not mm -hmm. all, there are there things that our students in Palau are going to misunderstand mm -hmm. and it's not fair to then use that same measure with other you know states and mm -hmm. other places because then we start feeling yeah. like look our kids are not smart right mm -hmm. but it's not nothing to do with that it's mm -hmm. is this test relevant and does it apply to the people that we're testing wow I mean that's, that's my own personal point. opinion yeah <laughs> it's a good <laughs> FYI point, my personal opinion yes um, um I know you're not a doctor yeah, um, but no I'm kidding. Uh, <laughs> yeah, in doctor education. of philosophy, not doctor of medicine. Yeah, no. um, we have uh, people. Uh, we have a few women who are pregnant. Mm -hmm. They take drugs, oh. alcohol. Yeah. Um, how can you share your experience if you had within the last twenty-eight years you've mm -hmm. been teaching? Um, 
like students who are not comprehending and not doing mm -hmm. well in school and uh, pa their parents taking drugs and alcohol yeah how can you um, well there I have had students um, when I first started teaching that had parents or a mom who used alcohol or drugs while they were pregnant and it does show um, these students tend to have either emotional challenges or some of them even have psychological challenges a lot of them usually have learning challenges um, and I mean you're putting your child at a severe disadvantage it would just be like if you're not eating healthy then your child if they're malnourished you would also give them a disadvantage mm -hmm. they grew up with a lot of physical health problems and social and emotional health problems so that's the same thing with drugs and alcohol um, yeah I would recommend not to doing it because that baby is ingesting all of those chemicals and it's biologically impacting mm -hmm. them and so from the beginning when they're born they're already having challenges being healthy physically and then as they get older and they will have challenges learning and they'll have behavior problems and you're just setting them up to have a really really hard life can you um, give us an example of because you said you've seen. Mm -hmm. Can you give us an example of what you've seen in your classes? Um, I had, this is when I first started, there was a student that had a mom who had used um, drugs and they had a really hard time telling the difference between fantasy and reality. And so mm -hmm. I would read out loud to them a story and then by the time they come back from recess, because we usually have language arts in the morning, um, that student when they start talking would be talking as if the story was about them right oh. they couldn't differentiate between the two because they experienced the story but it suddenly became their personal story and so then of course the peers are laughing at them right but then they don't understand mm. why and they're convinced that this is true this happened to me mm. but it's a book that i just read mm. <laughs> right before they went to recess and so it's it's just really sad as an adult to see how that child is in you know kind of being teased and they're confused and they're not quite sure why because in their perception they really believe that this is their reality but everybody else knows that it isn't the reality mm -hmm. and and um i'm not i'm not familiar with our palauan education system and i apologize for that but we do in the public school have special ed special mm -hmm. education yes. and so that student is going to end up having to have special education services pretty much for their you know whole educational mm -hmm. experience and then they um they're they're at a disadvantage mm -hmm. and it's very hard to overcome those because it's something that's um either been chemically altered in their brain or biologically they're at a disadvantage and that's just very sad so when you say that like there's um you know you, you were born and raised here and there's uh, a lot of plants tend to adopt or the grandparents mm -hmm, adopt mm -hmm. their kids kids mm -hmm. and then they go off to the u.s or wherever um have you um what can you share that um uh the parent because sometimes the parent tend or the guardian tend to blame their themselves mm -hmm. that the child is failing is because they're not putting effort right, right. but as you mentioned it will taking drugs and alcohol while you're pregnant mm -hmm. and then you give birth they will also have problem throughout their whole right. educational life right. what can you share with the parents who are listening or the guardians mm -hmm. to give them confidence and not blame themselves right well i mean clearly they did not choose to mm. you know have that experience for their grandchild um, and thank you for taking on those grandchildren mm. and raising them right because they need stable mm. adults in their lives um, but it isn't your fault I mean you can't control mm. what your adult children do but I think it's important to realize that we have to accept these children where they're at and whatever drugs the parents are using will impact every child differently mm. and so it's hard to say what's the one correct thing to do but love that grandchild mm -hmm. and support them as best as you can mm -hmm. and it's hard because some of them end up having behavior problems because it's just part of that not having that impulse control um and just being very patient and sort of teaching them mm -hmm. right how to behave well and um maybe 
if, if they're nervous and fidgety, like thinking about a way that they can get rid of that energy through maybe squeezing something in their hand versus like running around somewhere. And so just thinking about different strategies for them and not scolding them and telling mm-hmm. them to stop because it's something that they can't control, but just finding ways. Mm-hmm. And so I give my kids squishy things because it irritates me as a teacher, just my own little pet peeve, if people keep tapping. And so if I have a nervous kid who keeps tapping, I'll give them something soft and say, please squeeze this. You know, so they that way they're doing tapping. something. That, oh. Yeah. So then they're still doing that nervous behavior, but it's not something that's driving me or everybody else crazy. Mm. Um, and so just learning techniques like that. And, you know, I mean, and I think if a child, even if they're they're born with these challenges, a lot of them end up, you know, being gifted artists or being mechanically inclined mm-hmm. and they're good with their hands yes. and um, Art, yeah. finding something where they mm-hmm. can be successful because we all need to feel good and have positive reinforcement mm-hmm. for something versus always hearing these negative things mm-hmm. and why we can't be normal or like everybody else. It's a terrible mm-hmm. thing to, you know, yeah. burden a child with. Um, um, but it's not your fault as grandparents. Just um, you know. How do you handle attention deficit disorder kids or hyperactive mm-hmm. disorder kids? Yeah. So um, some parents, grandparents choose to medicate. Again, that's a personal decision. I'm not advocating mm-hmm. for that one way or the other. For some children, it works. And for others, they don't respond well to it. Like for some of my students, they get um, they lose their appetite. So they become really, really skinny and they don't want to eat because it oh. does something. But others are fine with it and it actually helps them. Um, but for, for teachers, it would be better to have them sitting closer to you. And then you don't want to scold children. I mean, that's just a personal, I mean, it, professional opinion of mine like you shouldn't be constantly scolding children and so I will talk to them and say you know when I'm teaching I want you to look at me right or to look at the screen that way I know you're paying attention and then we'll have like nonverbal signals where uh, you know I have them sitting close to me and so I'll maybe tap on their desk Mm -hmm. right but not something where you're yelling at them and Mm -hmm. calling attention but so that I explain to the child when I see you kind of staring off into the you know corner I'm going to come by and I'm going to tap your desk quietly that means you need to refocus right or or doing a timer I'm going to set my alarm to five minutes and I want you to just try your best to do as much as you can until you hear my alarm go off and so you're Mm -hmm. teaching them these like baby steps for how to keep themselves focused because they can't help it again that's a biological thing and so you give them these tools that are manageable and you help support them by giving them these signals. Mm. And then if their attention deficit, I mean hyperactive, they tend to need to move around, yeah. right? And so I let them stand. Like I don't I don't care where you are in my classroom as long as you're doing your work and you're not bothering somebody. So some stand at a counter and they're wiggling, you know, and they're doing their work and others lay on the ground. I mean whatever right but some teachers you know like to kind of control everything and so they want everybody sitting in their desk properly i mean but what you mentioned is actually really good Mm -hmm. because you notice that the the child your student has special needs or Mm -hmm. they're add or adhd Mm -hmm. and so you allow them to do whatever but as long as they're not interrupting the class the other students or the class then they can stand and but as long as they're paying attention yeah, That's so I had it. one who kind of kind of wiggled his butt all the time, <laughs> which is a little bit funny, but uh, but he did all his work. Mm-hmm. But if you made him sit at his desk, he'd be so distracted because he, and I call it wiggly body. Mm-hmm. Like if you have the wiggles, stand up and get it out. And for some, they just need to walk around, drink water, sharpen a pencil, and they're fine. But for him, he was so ADHD mm-hmm. that he needed to stand. Like he never wanted to sit. Wow. And he just wiggled all the time, but he did amazing work wow. because he was given that space to do it. That yeah. I, I think what you just shared is uh, actually a good uh, message to the young teachers Mm -hmm. so they can identify their kids that they're ADD, ADHD, or I'm sure their parents have informed them that, you know, my son or daughter has special need. And so they can actually do this in class Mm -hmm. rather than just have everybody sitting down and just and they become all anxious or nervous yeah because then you're setting them up to fail right if you know Mm -hmm. they need to get it out then let them get it out i mean they can stand and listen and do Mm -hmm. it it doesn't yeah so um throughout the 28 years you've been a teacher and your training your Mm -hmm. education have you come across uh uh boys and girls who will have been sexually abused 
and how did you handle that? I'm sure I must have. I taught at a middle school for a couple of years. Um, okay, I'm gonna confess something. I, I am super sensitive, and so mm. I've actually told our counter. Our counter would know all this information, and so I just told her, please tell me that they need TLC, which is tender loving care, mm. but do not tell me what mm. happened to them, because mm. then it Mm. I feel traumatized mm. knowing that they were victimized. Mm. And so she just knew that I can't handle that. So she would just mm. say, these students are TLC. And then I actually became the one that got a lot of these students. But I never knew what happened, like, mm. you know, if their parents died or whatever. I, I didn't want to know because I told her I don't want to then approach them. And, and I'm going to end up feeling sorry for them. Mm. And I don't want that to come mm. through. And so we just label them as TLC. And she's like, if you want to know the trauma, let me know. Mm. But if not just know that this this kid need and i'm like the mom right i'm everybody's mom and so it's like you they just need you to be a mom and they need to feel safe and i'll say like, okay and so i just do what i do mm -hmm. but i it was very hard for me to know what the trauma was mm -hmm. and i'm pretty sure some of these tlc kids must have been mm -hmm. sexually abused but i just can't yeah i will end up crying like mm -hmm. i'm terrible yeah, if the kid's pet dies and they tell me, then we cry together because mm. I can't just be like, oh, poor thing. And like, mm -hmm. I'm like, we're going to cry and have tissue and like, yeah. you know, because I, I just, yeah. yeah, I love kids and I just can't handle. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. But we I have mean, counselors. I don't mm -hmm. know if Palau has that, but we have counselors. And then my students go to see the counselor and I don't know why, because that's also confidential. Um, and so they just go and then they come back and I, you know. Just yeah, I on. think in high school they have counselors, mm -hmm. but not, I don't think, and advisors. Mm -hmm. But in elementary, I don't think they have counselors. Oh, that would be yeah. really important. Because the, the earlier you help children deal with their trauma, the easier it is for them to deal with mm -hmm. it. Because once, in sixth grade, they hit adolescence, right? Once hormones and puberty happens, then children have all these extra things that come out. Like some of them seem like they're okay in the beginning of the school year, but as they start going through puberty, they end up having um, like psychological issues. And so some students end up with eating disorders or they may end up with depression. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's important to set up a strong foundation early when they're very, very young versus waiting until they're now going through adolescence and you're trying to give them that support. If it, in my opinion, it feels a little bit late. Mm -hmm. um, so I strongly advocate the earlier children get help the better it is for them mm -hmm. to heal from whatever trauma they've experienced. Being a teacher, what's the most important uh, life of a child? Because I think I read in one book a few years ago that uh, the time to train and teach your child is uh, the early stages, kinder to, I think, first or second grade. Yeah. So as your experience as a teacher and your training, mm -hmm. um, what's the most important uh, age group for you to actually really teach your son or daughter well I'm, from your experience yeah I, I read somewhere and i can't remember where i read it but i remember reading that how your how a student is by the time they're eight is kind of the type of student that they will be oh. unless they learn to change right which is also why we do that sel because some of them have come in with you know habits that could be improved and so we continue to try to teach them but it becomes harder and it's, it needs to be more intentional um but i really do believe the younger they are um the easier it is to then address things right because children will not always articulate what their trauma is right mm -hmm. part of protecting yourself from trauma is not remembering what it is but then they're going to be acting out they're going to have behavior or maybe they may be overly accommodating or they could be defiant where they're pushing mm -hmm. back all the time um, but the earlier it is that they're um, helped, the better that, you know, the chances are for them to be successful mm -hmm. as students and also as people in their lives. Wow. Yeah. So let's get those counselors in K to six. Yeah, Senator just walked <laughs> yeah. in. Senator, he's the owner of oh, the radio Ali. station. Hopefully he can uh, work with the chairman of uh, education yes. in his oh, committee. Yeah. It's so, yeah. so important. Andrew Tabalwal, so hope he's mm -hmm. listening and we'll get some counselors for elementary grade school. That'll be, yeah. I think it's very, very important. Right. Yeah. It's hard for teachers. I mean, we are trained to do academic things and to build 
you know, classroom, you know, environment and build community, but we are not trained as a counselor would be Mm -hmm. and how to deal with different traumas and how to deal with um, different types of things like Mm -hmm. the the spectrum disorder and um, attention deficit, like all the tools that I have Mm -hmm. came from me observing students and then also the counselors and the different psychologists giving us um, special tips on how to Mm -hmm. deal with children with those, you know, with their needs. Wow. Yeah. Uh, I'm glad that uh, you shared because um, uh, I have a daughter that I adopted Mm -hmm. and um, her biological mother was on drugs and she's not ashamed to share and so I uh, my daughter I had and she always has challenges in Mm -hmm. school and I used to get frustrated but no and so (laughs) what I decided I pulled her out of school Mm -hmm. and I uh, had uh, we went to see uh, uh, another physician and um, he told me that and I I started sharing um, uh, the biological mother's uh, Uh, that she was Mm -hmm. under always taking drugs alcohol and so he said oh uh, something happened to the brain Mm -hmm. while if she was pregnant taking drugs and alcohol Mm -hmm. maybe it had damaged the brain and so she she has problems Mm -hmm. in school Mm -hmm. and so just listening to you saying that they'll have uh, problems throughout their uh, educational life is so true and um so I'm now she loves to draw so that's what I encourage Mm -hmm, her mm -hmm. and every school year there's uh, the missionary teachers rotate and so every school year I'm always telling the teacher that you know Mm -hmm. my daughter this is her problem and so um, when I share with them then they understand right but you know, not a lot of these uh, missionary teachers have that experience like what you have. Mm-hmm. And I'm sure some of our local teachers do not have that experience. And so um, I'm so glad we saw each mm-hmm. other because, you know, you you shared the social and emotional. Mm-hmm. And I think that's so important yeah. because, you know, I, the social social and emotional and mental of the child mm-hmm, mm-hmm. if th- it's not taken care of and it's yeah. not healthy the child won't be able to mm-hmm. absorb uh, what the teacher is teaching yeah and so i know throughout this whole talk show i think that's the most important mm-hmm. thing the social and emotional impact of the child yeah and i'm so happy that you shared that because i know a lot of teachers who are listening or who will be listening to this later mm-hmm. on, I think it's very important to actually really share with that, at least as you mentioned, 30 minutes before the class right, starts. Right. Wow, yeah. I mean. Well, and then they can contact me and I'm, I'm happy to share mm-hmm. examples just so that, I mean, it helps to have an idea of what that structure is mm-hmm. and then they can tailor it to themselves. Yeah. And then next year, if you would like me to do some professional development, I would be happy to do that. <laughs> Hopefully and the I minister is yeah. listening. So. Right. And I can bring all my, I can bring as many resources as yeah. I can. And it would help if, you know, if, yeah. if we knew that that was going to happen for the teachers to then tell me in advance what they would need mm-hmm. support with. Because I don't want to assume that I know anything about what teachers need here. But it would be helpful for me to then have that idea of what's necessary. And then I can, if I don't know it, I can, you know, ask my friends and counselors that I work with and bring as many tools as I can to share. Because I think that's what we need to do as educators. Um, Mm -hmm. We don't have a lot of money, right, in our school systems. And so if we all have different kinds of knowledge than we share, then that benefits our children. And that's what it's all about. And, you know... um, the new director of education, uh, Aida Rokoy. Mm-hmm. I really admire her, and uh, one of the young teachers shared with me actually two nights ago that, you know, Jennifer, I really did not like our director, but I have learned a lot from her. She mm-hmm. has taught me so much, even grading, and um, she also mentioned that if, uh, if your student is getting F all mm-hmm. the time, it's not the student that's the problem. It's you as a teacher that is a problem. Mm-hmm. And I really like that uh, quote 
that this young teacher shared with me about what director Rakoish mm-hmm. and I was I left and they, I, when I left the gym I was thinking about it and reflecting of what this young teacher had shared what Dr. Ragoy said, and I yeah. said, it's so, in a way, it's kind of true, because right. if the student is getting an F, then she should, the teacher should take it upon themselves and mm-hmm. say, what is my weakness that my student doesn't seem to comprehend and be able to improve their grades? Right, and then if I can push back just a little bit, mm-hmm. <laughs> um, I think sometimes when students fail something, um, not necessarily that the teacher is a failure, but but for the teacher, I mean, I see it as a challenge, as like a puzzle. Yeah. So if, if everybody else is doing well and the student keeps failing, then it's not like, oh, that child is not smart. It's like, okay, well, what's missing? There's some kind of gap. And so I feel like really happy when I'm able to talk to that child or look at their work and ask them like, well, what did you understand so that you can find what's missing? Mm. Because usually there's something that's missing. So it's like a puzzle. And once you figure out that missing piece and you are able to fill it for the child because you're the professional um, and they're able to then be successful, I mean, you both feel good because you're able to help a child move from failing to becoming successful mm-hmm. but to just be like oh well they got an f and then you move on that's not good teaching practice mm-hmm. you know like it's our responsibility to educate that's mm-hmm. what we do and so if a child fails there's a reason and we need to work with that child mm-hmm. to figure out what it is maybe they didn't study so they need to study and you give them another test but mm-hmm. um, a lot of times there's maybe like a skill or concept or even vocabulary that's missing mm-hmm. especially for your esl children your english second language or Palau and mm-hmm. second language learners. Usually it's a language miscommunication. Wow. Yeah. I feel like I'm in another world for the last uh, <laughs> one hour. I mean, it, you've shared so much. And again, I'm stressing the yeah. social and emotional mm-hmm. part that you mentioned. I think yeah. that's very, very important. Yeah. And I hope that our minister and our teachers and the director will hear this or they're listening, that they can uh, stress more about the social and emotional. Yeah. I think that's so important. Yes. I mean, I cannot even stop thinking about it and stop talking about it because (laughs) like I said if that's not full like you're you Mm -hmm. know when you eat you're full and they cannot seem to learn anything in school yeah Yeah. that's amazing and I hope uh, so when are you planning to move back (laughs) (laughs) I don't know if I can afford to live in Palau I heard it's very expensive over here (laughs) It's okay. You have your auntie Mindy and your oh. uncle Jeff, and she, you can eat kuka uh, every day and fish. That's yeah. our food. It's tempting. You know, my mom and I really love being back, and so we have um, made a commitment to ourselves that we're going to return every summer. And yeah. so, um, of course, I love just being on vacation, but I would and love to be get to know. And expensive because your auntie Vivian can give you a room. Oh, yes. Thank you. <laughs> and apartment to stay for free. Yes. Thank you to the VIP hotel. Yes. Um, yeah. And Senator Talams is also your uncle, so oh, you're right. all from Niwal. Thank you. And I'm sure your auntie Mindy made that suvaliwal with the aho. <laughs> yes, she did. It was delicious. Yeah, yeah they say that the um, uh, way to a man's heart is food. So see, see what your uncle's yeah. been eating, Jeff. <laughs> The Subali one. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, wow. I mean, I'm just. I thank yeah. you so much for coming, and I thank your auntie. Um, oh, I was blaming said, her. <laughs> so yeah. So I said, okay. This is the first time I didn't inform Senator. I called Janice, and I'm glad Janice said, text the boss and say, hey, we're having a show tonight. <laughs> Yeah, it's so exciting. I hope uh, the yeah. minister and director Aida is listening. So hopefully you said, you know, you're willing to come next year and maybe you can also help. I mean, yeah. some kind of workshop, you know. Right. And I don't need to be paid. I can mm-hmm. volunteer my services. I'm happy to help yeah. our people. Yeah, because yeah, uh, your Auntie Vivian can give you a free room at VIP. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> And then your Auntie Mindy's house. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. And last, we're wrapping up. Share with us about the grant about aquaculture. Yes. Um, so I was sharing with my Auntie Mindy because she's helping me learn about p- t- traditional Palawan plants and how to garden. Um, in Hawaii, I applied for a grant to do micro.
micro gardening. And so that was something that our Hawaii State Agriculture Department, they did a grant with the federal government. And so we're trying to increase food sustainability and also um, sustainable practices. And so I'm going to learn how to garden and I'm going to do home gardening and I'm supposed to share that food that I grow mm -hmm. with my neighbors and friends and family so that we help to increase the food supply. And um, Auntie Mindy thought that was a great idea and that people in Palau could use it. And you, I don't think you need to work hard to grow anything here because no. everything is just so lush. Um, but I think it's important to help, you know, increase the food mm. in any space that you're at. And um, So this yeah. grant is just for, uh, it can be uh, an organ NGO? It's, or no, oh. it's by myself. Oh, yeah. So it's so, just an individual yes. grant that you can apply? Yeah, so I heard it on our public radio and I went home and I Googled it and found the application and it, it's just for me. So I'm an individual who applied for that mm. grant and I actually got $5,000 wow. and it's to buy soil and all the necessary equipment and the reporting that I need to do is take before before pictures of my whole yard and then um, save all the receipts so that it, they can account for the money that they gave to me and then I need to show what I've grown and how many pounds of food that mm. I was able to add to our food supply in Hawaii. Mm. Um, and if I wanted to be a farmer's market person, then I, they would give me a license to sell. Mm. But I told them I was a new gardener and I'm not sure I would have enough to sell. <laughs> so I didn't sign up to be a farmer's market because I might have like two tomatoes. And so, <laughs> so I'm just going to share what bounty I have with family and friends. And maybe when I become an expert gardener, I can be at the farm farmer's market down the street. No, and maybe next yeah. time Mindy, your Auntie Mindy comes to Hawaii, you'll have a taro farm. Yeah. So before, yes, yes. come next summer and she'll yeah. teach you how to uh, <laughs> go to the taro patch and yes. the farm. <laughs> yes, yes. I, yes, I, yeah. I need help with that. So, yeah. 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 No, thank you so much, Robin. If um, uh, you want to do your closing, share a message to parents and students oh. and teachers, and then we'll wrap up. All right. Well, um, thank you, Jennifer, for having me here. And thank you, Auntie Mindy and Auntie Vivian, for pushing me to do this. Um, and Jennifer is a wonderful host, so thank you. I don't feel nervous anymore. But I, I really love learning, which is why I continue to learn, even though I've been teaching for 28 years. And I think it's important for all of us. Our children are the future, right? It sounds mm -hmm. corny to say, but it's really the truth. And so I think all of us as a community need to work together to help raise children who will then sustain our Palawan culture and heritage and traditional knowledge, but also to help children to be the best they can, regardless of whatever challenges they may have. Because um, that's, we can't not protect our children and help them be the best that they can be because they're a gift to all of us Amen. yeah and thank you to all of you for making me feel welcome <laughs> and we hope this won't be your last and we'll see you next year yes and I hopefully by then you'll decide to move back <laughs> Very tempting if you keep feeding me this way, yes. <laughs> and I hope our president is listening, so maybe he can try and convince you and Dr. Tori Byung Uel to move back and work at our hospital and our education. Oh, yeah. well, <laughs> you never know what the future holds. Yes. Amen. <laughs> yep. So, again, thank you, Robin, so yeah. much for sharing. I, I feel like, uh, not I feel, I've been inspired. Okay. And I know that just your story, I'm, I truly believe that you have inspired yeah. other parents and teachers. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Well, it's really nice. And um, um, how can they contact you if they want to sh get more information from you or like the newly teachers who would like to share and get advice from mm -hmm. you? Can they contact uh, you through Vivian and then Vivian can connect? Adang manggadamaran mreng asule la Miss Robin Girar Saul enga nganisra Vivian Girar Saul ma anti Gira Mindil bi ila Oktomle Rachef ma dalal guk mlosob el tagil ngel mei kadamal mreng asule mlosob il guk mei share experience alinga de hal ngartiang al gora ma old sis ak lang arang guk kora di share experience hopefully tigay idel ngayas kalbe esel sense aguk ngarin yal sab il 
so mati gal magtatal sense yendi akmal mereng asulel mlo sub el share cell wase cell emotional social and emotional rangal kaya kung tamra lo marang alwase maral close to tell tial blal dali le lak sa igit el social and emotional el el things rangal ka ang maral di al sub el mongil ngal grass school di al sub el mongil masubra al sa laklas magda ang gagit el lo ay silwase bekel tuta wao era lo mo la la klaser ni ang maltega o get el bung el lolsis akras students ang in mo organize at tablir sa igit el guk social and emotional impact ra klangar ra student mo hopefully ngayas kung sense el guk orang si omeser tiang asip il guk mo practice ni em ba lil one week em salwase ng order ako klaka order at least tega the let try di ko mda sa ng mal malungil advice el blal basket el enclosed to tell el sa igit el development rang alga especially sa el mal magkakaray magdamal mering asulim los sa mil loring sa omeser tiang enga igit el wase ar al sugum ang sorry ra adara education akme marulang idil ng rang eng mal sa el el kada bayol ng itel wase eng kang amre ra sunday ma bol sa el la minister al uban director ay dal kontak tni eh maybe in sa bilgu koragut maklia program ra el almel guk next year alu bang every day sell every quarter ang guk ngan niya break mang sa bilar ngal grass school el guk masub yal so mil kontak ta miss ni dar saul yah antir ni ra vivian ni dar saul asa bilmil di kontak ta obis ra vip alu ba antir ni ra mindi ni dar saul el blol ngan ra tropicana sa bil kontak tni ang niya connect ra kami leng gade al blol ngan ra social media mang sabi umilti kan taktik tigal antiringi at taka nektar kami hindi sugum ngayar other ministry ra education at sorry kan taktik ni el al time mga kol ra mindi al ubang Vivian at sabi umilter ni raw era lo Laura el lugup mega arrangement man sabi el ngagit el malwilling el contribute eh hopefully next year ang mukong el mubal merbela man sa el lol nga sergit ada mukong mal masaw lor el alkop singay ratemiw el gukmlo sa el amoy tatemiw o ring si omeser tiara tv matigil mo o ring si omeser tiara uriw ya dios lol mo lomakal tangat tergit rogoy matial balwat ko mal masulang